Radio X. So I'm John Kennedy, and that is the 1975 with the 1975, the opening track to the brand new album, The Third, a brief inquiry into online relationships. Tonight I'm playing you the whole thing, and I've got Matty Healy from the band sat with me to talk us through it. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure, very exciting, and it's always interesting to see just how the 1975 will reinvent the 1975, the introduction of a, of a new album, as yeah. it were, because this seems to be the trademark, that you do a version of the song or the, 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 the piece that we've just heard. Mm. Um, same words, different arrangement. Uh, wh- why is that? I don't know. I think there seems to be a lot of... Is it um, a lot of kind of self-reference? Uh, there's a very kind of meta element to the 1975. I suppose with it, what I, I think what we're doing is kind of like checking in, you know, every time you open the door and you see someone you haven't seen for a while. It's the same person, but you, your hair's different, you know? That kind of thing. I think the the desire to... To, to, I think it's about inclusion because it's like the video games and the movies and the music that I grew up the ones that I would obsess over would be the ones that made me feel personally addressed oh he's talking to me, so I hit the microphone because I'm so excited <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's talking to me this artist is talking directly to me so I think that if you if you don't know the band you can hear that it's just a piece of music but you know I like um it's it's not not in the humorous sense, but it's kind of a, a gag, you know. It's a it's a it's an in joke, and um, all of those things that kind of have helped us, you know, further this idea of community within a fan base because there's so much um, dialogue, but there's, there's so much of a kind of conversation back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great idea, and well, it, it, it's great that it's so much thought has gone into it. No, in a way. Or did that just emerge over time, suddenly? It's... it's, I'm obsessed with music, and I'm a human being, so I'm the protagonist in my own movie, you know? So everything is of of utmost importance to me, even though I know that art is probably quite far down on the list of stuff at the end of the days for us to sort out. So I think that I... It, I do find it very important, and I do think about these things a lot, but it's because I'm still the same kid. I'm just a bit... You know, I'm still the same record obsessed music loving waiting outside show kind of kid and um being lost in those worlds of you know and especially because i come from a time where you had the record the artwork and then what maybe one interview or something so like the artwork you'd have to create your own visual paradigm but i have the internet so i spend a lot of time expanding the uh the band the the band visually and through all these kind of ideas and the 1975 I suppose is the ultimate that that idea kind of crystallised yeah yeah exactly um, and so third album in mm. um, how did you approach this one how did we approach it I think that there was a real reversion to the oh, the, 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 the EPs that preceded the first album were all kind of cut in let's call it my bedroom um, in Cheshire in the countryside kind of on undistracted and um we've made our albums in different places but i just thought that we we wanted we knew that we wanted to like live together for a year and just live the record and not write a record and then take it somewhere and record it over six weeks you know there's a lot a lot of the record you know bits were bits that were recorded in george's flat or my house you know are the, are the, are the bits that made it on the record and it's this all oh all uh this kind of sprawling thing and it was a, it was just a very lived thing we let things happen and um, and it was it was really it was really a lovely experience i think it's materialized in a record that at times is quite serious but um we're not messing about when we're making music do you know what i mean so i think that's why but the environment was actually there's a lot of love in the room you know it's, yeah. it was a nice place to be so you all live together where where in ben. in between like Oxford and Northamptonshire, right? Kind of in in this studio called Angelic, and and, and it kind of sums it up uh, English countryside. Um, and we set up there in January for the idea of being no, yeah, for like three months to to go there for like a couple of months, and we left in 
October. Right, so this is 2017. So that is pretty much yeah, 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 exactly. three quarters of the year. Yeah, exactly. It's 2018, sorry. 2018. That- so 2017, I stopped touring around about June of 2017. Right. Started, gave ourselves a little bit of time off. Started um, writing and stuff. Went into one kind of small session in October. I subsequently then sent, went, sent myself off to rehab. Got back together in December. And then we moved into that house in January. So January until August. I mean, we put Give Yourself a Try out, the first song. The, yeah, the, first yeah, the one we were about to play. One we're about to yeah. play. We put this out when the record was, I'd say, three quarters done. Be My Mistake hadn't even been written. Like, th- like we were really just moving with it. And right. Then, and it, and it, it, it was an exciting time. That's fantastic. So it's really, really fresh. Really fresh. It is 2018. It's in all 2018. I mean, there's there's things that, that there's there's ideas. The original idea of love it if you made it. I couldn't be more in love. I always want to die. They go back to when we're touring, but there wasn't there wasn't a sense of urgency back then to get anything finished. So the the real lion's share of the work happened what happened in 2018 yeah yeah and one of the things that i really love is that insistent repeated motif that runs throughout the whole of the song yeah. that i can't work out what instruments you're using is it a violin is it a guitar um and and it links to me uh, to a band from belgium from the 90s called Dea. so even oh, yeah. though but it has that kind of feel to it somehow because of what i think is a violin but i'm sure it's probably not a violin it's a mix of loads of things i think it's like maximalism and minimalism at the same time everything is so extreme but there's so few things there um i think that i wanted to start a record with that sense of anxiety that i think is shared by everybody now everything's a bit more anxious everything has more of an edge to it and um I think that because the song and the sentiment was quite forgiving and quite um, kind, I felt, um, I wanted a real... You know what it is? Like, off, uh, Sorry, I talk so much, but like our first record was this kind of, I think I was trying to do like the apocalyptic sense of being a teenager in a major key. The major key is really important to me because beautiful music sometimes can be so pretty that it's beautiful. Most of my favourite music is kind of not to be too technical, but major key orientated music that comes from the real left field. So you could use the entirety of Loveless as an example for that, or, you know, Just Like Honey, or like, um, I think that this, the faded splendor, pop songs that sound like they're drowning, like, you know, like, like if you took Give Yourself a Try and produced it a different way, it would be this pure celebratory thing but there's a fragility to it that that, that um i think was just naturally there in us and we wanted to translate so so yeah and it kind of that's that's how it is and i think at that time doing a beat at that speed yeah didn't feel right it <laughs> I was more there, so that's where it happened. And it's interesting you talk about the anxiety that we all feel, and yet, in many ways, it's got a nice positive message. Give yourself a try. I think there's a there's a I think the, 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 there's lots of um, there's lots of uh, lines that run through the record, but I think um, I think hope is definitely one of them, um, and I think that the yeah. I think that that there is a real desire to better oneself and it's difficult, isn't it? Sorry, it's difficult to talk objectively. Maybe we should listen to the song and then I'll be more eloquent. Okay. Um, I mean, you're right. I mean, And it's super catchy, this yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting because it is dance floor friendly, but you could have gone... Um, heavier you know that's the interesting thing there's a certain restraint in how you've you've made it i think because it's quite hypnotic it's very dancey but you could have gone really yeah. straight to the floor and really hit it home but you've restrained yourselves as well which kind of makes it more more delightful yeah it's, anyway. it's, it's on the back it's kind of on its toes a little bit and i, and I really like that it um it's um it's swinging it's jovial i love it mm. I'm intrigued to know how the 1975 put these songs together. You know, how does the working operation of the four of you in a room working on, on the music? Because, say, as with um, Give Yourself a Try, sometimes it's really hard to pinpoint what is what. What is that instrument? What created that sound? And, and then how have you manipulated it? How have you taken it further and then created this, this other thing? Because listening to the records, potentially, you, 
while some songs are clear, oh, that's an acoustic guitar, that's a piano, but some of them, um, it's much more blurred, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I think that that we um, we are obsessed with music, and that doesn't stop at just the cultural aspects of it or the history of it or how it makes us feel like sonically as producers, you know. We have to sometimes avoid not getting too lost because we could spend days and days and days. I think that um, I like subversion of form. I like, you know, the same reason that like I love being on the being played on the radio like next to Ariana Grande, but like my lyrics being the way they are is because I could do that in punk music. We could have been a punk band. We could have been one of these bands, but I want to subvert. I want to actually be punk. You can't be punk in punk anymore. You know, I want to be punk. The only place to be punk is where there's no punk. So, and I think that the subversion of form, what does a guitar sound like? Do you know what I mean? How loud should it be? You know, like what, what, um, there's so many accidents as well. Like Eno will say, like, you know, inspiration don't come looking for you. It's not sitting there going, hold on, I've got an idea. It's three hours into playing the same keyboard sound into this synth that just isn't working. And then there's this one thing that happens. You go, oh, that's interesting. And that goes away. Like two time was like, sometimes things will take months. Two time was I was making a brew. We were working on a song. George and me were producing a record for an artist called No Rome. Mm -hmm. and he's got this song called Narcissist that I featured on. I'm in the kitchen making a brew. The the loop on Logic was set to two bars, and you can play the song all the way up to the two bars, but when it gets to the two bars, it'll just start looping it. We didn't realise the loop was on. Got to the end of the song, and it just started looping the chords, which made them play backwards. And I was like, hey, up, from the kitchen, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that became the chord structure for two time. And then, and then you're off. Do you know what I mean? And then it was, then it was easy. We had a synth sound. We had a thing. We, had, we it was all there. So it's just about like embracing all those kind of bits of serendipity and yeah, happy accidents happy that can accidents. take you down a, a road that you didn't even know you could go down. Oh, yeah, of yeah, course. Which is so exciting. Which is interesting with <coughs> how to draw petrichor, petrichor, yeah, pe petrichor, petrichor, yeah. petrichor um, which is absolutely fantastic. Is it a one song, two titles, a song of two halves, two songs. Two songs. It's two, how are you it's thinking an, of it? I, I think it's how to, the idea of how to draw those lyrics and that vague chord, chord progression was part of a B-side that I'd put out before. Petrichor was a word that I couldn't not have as a song title because it's my favourite word in the English language, the smell of rain after a hot day. I think it's, it's something that we know so well, but maybe a word that we wouldn't use. And how to draw Petrichor was kind of an homage I think I think sonic I think musically it's an homage to you know the things that you can hear Sigur Ross Boards of Canada um, MJ Cole Burial I mean it's really interesting like I I suppose that my view of England I love to see the countryside as Sigur, Sigur Ross and kind of the night time as like the M25 burial. Do you know what I mean? So, like, <laughs> and that's kind of how I, I wanted to make a song of like waking up in the in the morning and travelling through the night and it goes from that kind of foggy, what I see, of kind of like the, the fields of Cheshire to that kind of the street lights of the M25 at, at night listening to the streets or MJ Cole or, you know, Wookiee and Lane or any of that kind of stuff that yeah. I've always been into. So it's a big homage to the UK. Wow, uh, that's fascinating because the, the the opening part of it is so beautiful, you know, and there's this music box element to mm. it, uh, almost filmic, almost could be music you'd hear in a Disney film or, or something is, like that. I mean, it, sorry, the Disney film thing is a big thing for me, right? It's a big thing for me because not only is there loads of really interesting archetypes in Disney stories, and I think that Disney stories are really informative to like the human spirit. We grew up with wonder like wonder kind of having a sound like the sound of Disney is kind of the sound of like wonder right somebody said something to me which was one of my favourite compliments ever they said the 1975 is kind of like a, a to, to them I'd never owned this but this is something to someone that was so flattering so it's kind of like a Pixar movie where like you know it's for young people you know, it's for young people and it's exciting and it's kind of uh, pretty. But there's so much there for the older generation. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And uh, 
there's so many parallels just to what we try and do with in the same way that what I try I just try and be like Disney Pixar <laughs> I mean like but musically and philosophically like it's such a powerhouse of emotion it's incredible because like I think that I Stance by Danny Elfman which is the Edward Cezanne soundtrack that was a big part it's a big piece of music for me and I think that there's a lot of that in in here yeah Plus a bit of Wookiee and MJ Cole, and which MJ is fantastic. Cole. It's an amazing combination. And I'd love it if we made it is another really striking song from this album and, and a really striking song you know, when it kind of came out on its own, you know, when it wasn't part of the album. But the way that you follow How to Draw a Petrichor with that song and, and you know the kind of beauty of the string arrangements and stuff on, on on that and then mm. suddenly we go into this it's really yeah. interesting and and this song seems to be able to be read in in so many different ways you know is it a, a protest song is it um a, 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 a cry for help i don't know it's it's a really interesting series of words combined with the music uh, i think that the, the the question still is is there with me because I, it really is a very it really is a question i think that even at my most Sat, the, the, my most I think my, a performance with my most conviction um, me when, me at my most intense I'm still not really expressing an opinion still kind of more like signposting asking questions l looking for hope um, I don't judge anybody you know I don't tell anybody how they should live I just I, I just ask questions so I don't know if it is a protest song I don't know I don't know what it is, but I know that it struck a chord with people. Um, and I think it's because sometimes art has the ability to present the real world as a dystopian thing, future that we should worry about. And sometimes when it's maybe, it, you know, it can be quite close to home. The way that it was written, though, was just that I gave myself time, and I, I feel that I think that every time I was just really profoundly moved by something that happened, something that made me really angry, I am, um, I just added to it. I think, that, and, and and I was so happy to have that when George showed me that piece of music because, as soon as I started, what's the word, jamming to it, mm. listening to it, and singing over the top, I was so. There's so many things that I knew that I kind of wanted. There, there, there was actually there wasn't so many things I knew I wanted to talk about on the record, but there was just I I I, I could kind of feel where I was going to go with it. But I, but there was one thing that I'd set myself uh, uh, that I was going to do something really outward. And then when I, when George gave me this piece of music, it was such a relief. <coughs> I think that's why the the first word is a is the F word mm. because when I first heard it, I was thank you know get in you know yeah. thank you like yes i have this to i i can do this um and yeah it's 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 like you know i think because it's so objective and it's so about what we're all so worried about and the things that affect us so are i finally like i'm rehearsing at the moment because i got a first tiny show tomorrow like it um i think because it is so outward, and a lot of the time I've spoken about the world, it's through speaking about myself. I go, I'm like this, and then it speaks of something bigger. Love It If We Made It isn't like that. Um, and it's kind of, se we feel a bit separate from it now, you know, like we've rehearsed, we've been rehearsing, and we're so lucky to all just be like best friends, my mate from maths, my mate from, like we're all mates, uh, all the crew, and we've been rehearsing for a year we don't we take our music very seriously we don't take ourselves seriously when we're rehearsing we rehearse the song and then we mess about you know love it if we made it brings a real tone to the room um once we do it because it to do it properly and rehearse it in order to like record it and listen to it and get it right i have to really do it and it's I, it really moves me because i'm not doing the whole it's not like a I just find it really moving because I'm not, I don't, not like I'm so proud of it or anything, or I think I've done something amazing. It's just like, I don't know, it's like, it just, um, it feels, it just makes me sad. Mm. I think. It's interesting because some of the lines are taken from 
headlines on newspapers, yeah, and some well, of the lines are, are things that people have said. Yeah, uh, certain people from mm. dev- various different walks of life, and they're kind of all smashed together mm. uh, in a really interesting juxtaposition with with the, the music that almost has a kind of a, a jazz quality to it. That is, in a way, the first kind of jazz part of the album because. The, Jazz as a reference or as a as a colour comes up a lot on this record, you know, it, and it kind of ties in with nineties R and B and soul, or sure. in that way, or Michael Jackson or Whitney Houston, but all sorts of other things as well. Which is it's a really interesting combination it's of, a, I of think, things. I think it is. I think that there's a lot of black music in there, mm. and um, the vocal delivery is anathema to that. And I think that's probably quite interesting as well. Like it gets pretty groovy, it gets pretty funky. Yeah, as we're you know, on our way to hell in a handbasket. So it's it's a it's a weird vibe. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Love it if we made it is followed by "Be My Mistake," which mm-hmm. is a complete contrast to that. Yeah. One of the last songs written for the record you've already mentioned, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I say that in regards to just stuff being finished. I think right. that you know you can probably find verses written over here. Very seldom are things written as one thing. So I think the idea for the song sentimentally and, and musically goes way back um, I think Be My Mistake you know is about it's very personal it's, 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 it's about guilt it's about growing up you know it's about the unfortunate thing that you learn in life you know it's just those things that you learn like you know that it's um, you know people don't change until it's too hard not to you know that's something that I've learned um, the things that you really want you know that you'll find the things you really want in the in the places you least want to look, you know, like these kind of things. And I think that being my mistake is about, you know, coming to terms with the inevitability of that, you know, process. And um, but I, I'd like to actually talk more musically about mm. being my mistake because um, the thing that I have really enjoyed I, I'm really enjoying at the moment is being where we are musically because by the time you do your well whatever it is it could be your fifth or your, th- your third thing things are really starting to happen for us um, our identity is starting to solidify and we're, we're becoming way more inventive and there's this element on the record that runs across how to draw be my mistake the man who married a robot surrounded by heads and bodies there's this out of time delicate should we call it plinky plonky piano thing it's never in reference with what's going on it's just happening it has its own thing and um um it's such and the reason that it has such the same texture is because we kind of invented that intru- instrument we there's this synthesizer called the OP1 that I uh, imagine you have a keyboard in front of you mm. and the there's just a microphone on it. So, if I were to hold down the key and then sing into it, ooh, and then take my finger off the key, when I press it again, ooh, I get my voice. So I've immediately got a keyboard, ooh, of my voice. If you get a piano and bring it up to the microphone, hold down the key, boom, and then run through the octave, dum, 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 and then take it off. When you hold down this key again, dum, dum, you get four notes. With it in the octave on one key so if you start playing like, like a piano it doesn't make any sense but you've it's a recorded sample so it has this I think with real music real, real instruments because there's so much synthesis in music nowadays I love it when they sound like they're striving to be even realer you know that ambient music that sounds really pretentious but you know best ambient music sounds like it's trying to be a river or trying to be a <laughs> yeah, tree yeah. or trying to become the ocean do you know what I mean and I think that those delicacies you get from instruments with acoustic support like pianos acoustic guitars and I think that this record has been a big experimentation on how modern you can take the because of course we can take a piano and make it sound like Scandinavian house music from the 90s, thin it out. Do you know I mean? we, we've done the piano. But like letting these things really take centre stage and the noise and the um, the space in between. And, you know, we're getting into a world now where like Nils Fram is miking up his fingers mm. on the piano. 
Like, it's... People... I don't know. I think production is getting into this really textured place, and I hope that we're part of furthering that, that idea. Um, yeah, sorry, I digress. No, no, I, I'm really pleased you brought that up because it's been intriguing me with the new record, how mm. you've created those those sounds, and obviously the piano runs through the album quite a lot, and, you know... At, when you hear it, sometimes it, it's like you're just sitting at a piano and playing it. But so what? More often, it's this crazy textured feel oh, that you've created, like... which is really interesting and and exciting and and hard to imagine how you create that. But you've kind of explained it really, really well. Yeah, um, you do. Love, the, the, the piano, the piano has been um, has been used, and, and I know that we have to talk about the whole album, mm. but I think it's probably relevant. To for us to talk about like kind of the way that we do things like um things like uh we took all of the wood off a piano so it's just the strings and the keys and then i taped down all of the notes on the piano that i wanted so everything in c and then sang through the piano so there's this read chord singing kind of worked but what really worked was getting like a guitar amp and playing some really insane feedback into the piano and then shutting it off immediately and then capturing that this ghostly reverb that's but it's all real it's like it's like cgi man it's like sometimes when you like old great cinema or something it's like our new video i like it when you just watch something you watch something happen you know we're so desensitized with like kind of cgi like it doesn't really affect us like it doesn't it doesn't mean anything to us like I think like but acoustic support real things you know like real that's why everyone wants a Polaroid camera and a vinyl in 2018 because we want that tactility and I think that there is a a, a subconscious human resonance with some of this record because the human body like humans like real sounds they like reverberations I mean it's vibes, man. I'm doing air quotes. I'm doing air quotes. But do you know what I mean? Like, it's just vibrations, right? That sounds like such an idiot, but it's so true. Yeah. No, you don't, and it is. <laughs> and there's some, again, really interesting sounds at the start of that song. Mm. You know, it's, it sounds like it could be a table being moved <laughs> in the room. It is. Or, right. There's a lot of uh, dishes being done, tables being moved, uh, people coming in when they shouldn't. Um, there's a lot of life yes, in it, you yeah. know? There, there's a lot of it in it. Um, I think that sincerity is scary. Is it, it, as We love songwriters, so paying homage to songwriters, there's obvious references to, you know, well, the, I think one of the most obvious is probably the, the reference to Disorder by Joy Division in, in Give Yourself a Try. But also there's a lot of production nods. I think sincerity is scary is us kind of doing Jay Diller you know, or kind of D'Angelo voodoo kind mm. of. Uh, the reason that Roy Hargrove, who said who passed not long ago, about two and a half weeks ago, and um, he's the only other musician apart from some of our friends who's ever played on the nineteen seventy five on on, on nineteen seventy five record. Um, as much as we didn't know him very well, we we took his passing quite hard because it was the first time that death had graced the 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 music. Something kind of died. And um, a lot of those melodies and hooks that are inherently the 1975 came from Roy. Um, and Roy is all over Sincerity is Scary. That's all of him on the horns. And he's all over mine and a couple of things on our last record and some things on our record that's coming out next uh, year. Uh, are all the brass parts then by Roy on uh, on the record or are there other brass players too? No, no all just Roy. all Roy. All wow, Roy. amazing. I just used all him. I don't want to use anyone else. Yeah. So we made a trumpet section out of him and... And um, I mean, he was one of the best musicians I've ever been in a room with, uh, if not the best. Because there's an element, you know, like, you know, Jimi Hendrix on the guitar, like Jeff Buckley singing, like there's like a divinely decreed, uh, like there's, some of us are, are great, but then some people are operating on like another level. And he was one of those people. And um, yeah, so therefore, of course he was troubled, you know, and, um, and, 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 and died way too young but sincerity is scary is is um i mean that's why we knew roy because i was such a big fan of voodoo 
you know and such a big fan of, of his work on that those record on that record and so I think that you know hip hop is a big part of our lives you know what I mean I'm like I'm 29 years old like it, it should be you know <laughs> like it's been I've been there's been so it's been the entire history of hip hop has kind of happened in my lifetime do you know what I mean so mm. it's um I'm very big fan of it and there's and there's a lot of reference on there but I think it it's um it's it almost has like a um Bill Withers vibe to it like like, like you know like a song yeah. for the morning or you know like when I wake up in the I don't know it reminds me of that kind of thing it's definitely as much as it obviously references 90s black music I think it's referencing 70s black music quite overtly and then the lyrics of it are about you know how it's way it's the, one of the hardest things for all of us to do is look like a bit of a knob in front of our mates you know so maybe I can't say that word but like being embarrassed in front of our mates is something that we hate do you know what I mean it's way easier to take the mick or be sarcastic in in the face of like earnest in the face of serious stuff like being soppy looking like a bit of a mug do you know what I mean like mm. getting it wrong being naive they're the, like the hardest things to do you know and I think that even in pop culture and television like we we deconstruct everything so much everything's a joke you know adverts I don't know if you've been to America recently but there's not an advert in America that isn't a joke about it being an advert you know everything's a joke and it's not like I'm taking it pretty seriously now you know life and um so, like it's we shouldn't like everything's so like, everyone's so scared of cheesy things like things that try and teach us a message but maybe we've got something to learn <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean <laughs> considering what's going on yeah that's interesting and it's interesting because in a way with the music there's a kind of choir on sincerity mm, is scary yeah. and so um that isn't cheesy though no, no it, it's it's kind of being sincere isn't exactly. it? it it kind of backs up the the idea that hang on a minute let us have be brave enough to be sincere and open and frank with people exactly you no know, and you and you have employed that choir in that way now who are they all you singing or is no, that no that's UGC that, that's uni, uh, the, the LGC uni, London LCG London Community Gospel Choir right whatever the acronym is yeah. but yeah we use them all the time they become mates of ours they were on the last record they performed with us at the Brits they like I love gospel music I mean that's the thing is it's the only it's the one chance that the religious had with me do you know what I mean like if you're born you know, you know you're a product of where you're born but if I was went to gospel church like the feeling that I get when a gospel choir sings is this deeply deep feeling in me mm. like the, the the what do we call it like I don't know the God like the uh, the God frequency that's what starts resonating right I don't know what it is if I was five years old and my dad was like you know that feeling that you've got that's God I would believe it to this day because it's in you. You feel it, man. Like you feel something. I don't know what it is. Unfortunately, I don't think it is God, but there's <laughs> something going on. And, and I think that the um, conviction of church music, I mean, praising doesn't get more sincere than that, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's humanity. Maybe it's just the, the feeling of, of humanity. Yeah. Maybe that's what it is. I Like America and America Likes Me is the next song mm. on the new album by the 1975. What can you tell us about this one? I think that it's um, like every song that we probably get to at this point now is a departure from everything else. Um, I think it's our homage to now, 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 right now, musically. It doesn't get more now for me than the production of that song. Um, I think that there's a real confusion and a real desperation and a real and a real tension in the generational gap that exists now and I think young people feel like their voices of progressive change are being drowned out by these kind of regressive ideals and that feeling of being drowned out, you know, that feeling of being misrepresented, that feeling of being so powerful as a unit but not knowing how to utilise it, you know, um, misconceptions. I mean, there's a line on the record which is like, K 
kids don't want rifles, they want supreme. <laughs> you know, like, um, I think that... And then musically, it's how... I, I couldn't couldn't make a record now and not make a song like that yeah it's 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 twinned with so much music that i listen to so much music that i'm invested in and it's like what i'm desperate for is that the thing right i'll tell you actually let me say this properly what i see with trap let, listen I, I hate lingo so you have to look at the, how it happened you know you've got three six mafia lil wayne all these kind of things these things then turn into what we can call i don't know trap music young thug the pop, the pop stars that came out of that, like Fetty Wap and Ray Shremard, and so we've got this Soldier Boy. We have this huge, big thing that happens, and with trap music, early Migos, like early Thugger, that kind of thing, it was our, it was this generation's, and kind of is this generation's punk, right? DIY being done in crack dens, supposedly, but talking about the idea of getting out and creating something bigger, right? It was this proper subcultural thing. And you have artists like Kendrick Lamar that don't sit in the SoundCloud world because they also don't sound like that. Kendrick Lamar will make a record like Damn, which is better than all of those records, but it doesn't sound like 6 9 It doesn't sound like Future. It doesn't sound like Michael made it. But this is pop music. Juice World, all these kind of things. This is pop music. Like, I'm waiting for, like, we got, like, Lil Zan, we got, like, Lil... Th I'm waiting for, like, Lil Meaning. <laughs> like, I'm waiting for the one Lil, Lil Baby, I don't care which Lil one it is. And I'm not looking at Kendrick Lamar or J. Cole or other people in hip-hop. I'm looking at this SoundCloud face tattoo, take a bunch of Xanax thing that is the biggest thing in the world right now. I want it to be subverted by a real, real message. And I think my desire for that is in I like America and America likes me. Um, it's not my job though. Yeah. Because I'm not a lil. <laughs> <laughs> but I can I can hear what you're saying and hear, hear the passion that that you believe in this. It's fantastic. And that is such uh, a, a different sounding track to include on any album. And I've noticed that people are connecting it to Fitter, Happier mm -hmm. uh, by Radiohead on OK mm -hmm. Computer. But it's almost as if you take that idea and and push it much, much further and obviously make it much more 21st century, really. Well, yeah. I, I don't. That's what I found really interesting. I don't do anything with that song. That's what I find really interesting. Fitter, Happier, when we all first heard that, I mean, I would have been a lot younger. The reaction was, Ugh, you know, a synthesized voice. That's horrible. That's scary. That's reflective of dystopia. We don't want that. Now, that song, the amount of people that won't have even noticed that song was on when we just played it. The idea of a synthesized voice, we put it in our kitchen. We're like, get me the new Lionel Richie album. Do you know what I mean? Like, whatever you ask. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, is Lionel Richie still making records? Um, it's like, we're so desensitized to that idea that it's not even strange um, I think that those voices answer to us or replicate us they reinforce our perspective we never hear their perspective I think hearing something that seemingly comes from the perspective of artificial intelligence is really unsettling and I think the thing with the Man Who Married a Robot, there's a couple of gags in there. I don't actually go hard on the Orwellian, dystopian reality that we live in. I really don't. I say like a couple of things, but because that voice is reading it, it sounds like it's describing a dystopian future. And your realisation that it's not, I think, is the thing that, well, bothered me. Do you know what I mean? It was... um. The piece of music came first and then I was listening to this beautiful piece of music called Woozy with, Woozy with Cider by James Yorkston, an amazing poet, mm. folk musician. And um, I realised I wanted to do something spoken word, but not spoken word. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought, well, whose voice is that? And I was like, oh God, of course. Blummin'. Siri. <laughs> <laughs> 
Your pal. <laughs> My mate. Everyone's best mate. How weird. It's great, though. It really works. But it's interesting because of the music that you combine it with. You know, because there are those kind of brass flourishes there, the music builds up, mm. it subsides, you know, mm. that's almost like a, you know, there's an ebb and flow to it as well, which mm. helps the emotion of, of what Siri is saying to us and the story that he's telling us. Mm. Um, and did, so did you wrote out all the words once, I mean, you, you, that was... It was, uh, it was five, it was 25 minutes, right. that story. Yeah. So it was... We were listening to the piece of music and I was saying to Jamie, I was like, you should have some kind of story. And then I was like, I know, like, oh, it should be Siri. And we we're like, I was like, oh my God, right, wait, 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 wait. So I went off to figure out. So I was like, stood there going, Siri, read this note, seeing if it did it. See, because I didn't even know if you could get it to read stuff back. And it was like, okay. And then it read the note. I was like, right, wait, wait, wait. So I went off and I just wrote this thing and we recorded it. And that was it. And then I thought, this is the thing that I always say. Trust your instinct. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, trust the that, that when you can't get it out, that excitement is probably going to be more poetic than something that you think is really calculated. You know? Like, just, I, I had to, like, you know, I, I tried to rewrite it a couple of times, but then I was like, no, it's fine. Like, but then you're like, no, but you did that in 10 minutes, so it can't be good. It's like, you're chasing shadows after a while, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, just got to just do it so it was very very quick turnaround man who made a robot it was then but then recording the orchestra and writing the orchestra writing the strings and yeah. doing the whole orchestra arrangement obviously t was the line was, took the most amount of time but and is that something that you handled the band all handled or did you get anybody yeah, we, else we involved have in sam that? sam swallow who's an, uh, an amazing arranger has worked with me for years um oh we're, we're, we're incredibly out we know what we're doing but mm. i'm i'm not um I don't like, I'm not a, uh, what's the word? A, it's a uh, tyrant or whatever. I, I, I like collaboration. Do you know what I mean? So I just always get people to help me, like music videos. I, I still want a great director there, even if I want it to be my own thing. So, mm. so yeah, so it's just, but that, that's the thing that took the work and recording it and getting the orchestra to play it perfectly and not being an, an ass when they don't. <laughs> <laughs> and where where did you record the orchestra? Who Abbey Road. Were, oh right, okay, yeah. right. And and who were the orchestra? Who are the orchestra? Oh, they, I, I, they they were they were beautiful musicians who were who were just recommended to me. I don't know right. if they so were assembled a for the purpose. Or, assembled yeah, for the yeah, purpose through yeah. the, through the arranger. He he sorted out people who he thought would be best, and they were great. Yeah. Fantastic, and and did Sam work on all the strings on the record? So, so if we go into Inside Your Mind, and that yes. are those strings on um, that, or is that? Th yeah, Sam, ar Sam arranged, helped me arrange the strings on mine, and so David Campbell, who did Iris by Goo Goo Dolls, mm. did I Always Want to Die. That's right. the last song, which is coming up later. Which is coming up later, and then Sam did everything else with me inside your mind yeah yeah we did we did everything yeah. else together yeah yeah but they're all written by us and then he just goes you know you should put that on a vi viola do you know what i mean like right. he knows what he's doing yeah um, fantastic um and with inside your mind and it's interesting because one of the many different sounds that, that is in there is it connects to give yourself a try you know there's a little tiny element that reminds me of the the guitar line that I think is a, a violin yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, kind of reprised or I mean and then you, you weave that that kind of approach throughout the whole album don't you mm -hmm. where you know there are references that help connect it all together of and course. help create your sound world for this record of you know course. which is so important and and create such a fantastic whole though that yeah. makes it such a good thing to listen to as a whole I, I like motifs mm. in work I love it in music I love you know like uh, repri reprises I love the the fact that we're going on a journey, you know, you know, and and it's part and it's a yeah, it's a story. It's 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 a movie. It's like movie. It's like movie, right? Mm. I think I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Inside your mind, is this a love song? How do you Oof, view this? You tell me. That, well, <laughs> I was hoping you'd explain that. My for girlfriend, me. <laughs> my girlfriend thinks it's really sexy. So then I was like, right, I'm I'm golden. So I was sweet. Because yeah. I just told her about it. I showed her the idea of it. That it was like, what was the line at like, the back of your head is at the front of my mind? Yeah, which is Soon a great I'll, line. Thank you. Soon I'll crack it open just to see what I'll find. Um, 
yeah, let's not beat around the bush that sometimes you just want to know, don't you? Like, stop doing all that thinking. I hate it when you're doing that. I can tell that there's something going on. Listen, a lot of my work is about the grey area in between the thought and the said. I think that that's a big thing that I've covered, you know? What is said, what is felt and what is said and everything that we feel in between. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's, you know... But inside your mind is... It's like when I say the two time, you know, you can't leave out the dancing. I can't leave out the sinister, you know. We're all a bit sinister, right? And then um, there's um, violence and romance are intrinsically linked, and it's very da it's a very taboo thing to uh, talk about, let alone appreciate. I'm not a violent person at all, physically or emotionally. But there's something morbid about sexual desire and relationships and voyeurism and all of these things that we're constantly engaged with. And sometimes I want to smash my girlfriend's head open. <laughs> I'm laughing <laughs> because you're smiling. <laughs> and I think it's important to <laughs> point that out <laughs> because especially the, the way you've, you've kind of slowed your voice down and started to explain that you know, <laughs> brought a sinister feel <laughs> to the whole thing. But um, yeah. I think that it's like, you know, it's also an album. I'm messing about. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's music. Like, it's it's where... Art is a safe space. Like, you know, th th I think that one thing, if you want to say, if you want an opinion on how I feel about Inside Your Mind, it's like, I always reference Brian, you know, because he says such brilliant things. And the expectancy for one to live like their art is. So you see an artist and you think, it's probably like that. They're probably not. Because when you have art as a vehicle and it becomes this place for you to experiment, you take risks and are bold in ways that you would never be in your real life. And it, that's where you get it out, you know? Like, if I can't... The, the, I find those ideas interesting, like sinister sexual ideas and stuff like that. I, I definitely don't want to explore them. <laughs> but I don't want to ignore them. Yeah. So let's put them in something that doesn't really... that isn't really that that important. Like, well, no, to me it's incredibly important, but you know... Stop putting it. Like, it what else? Yeah, I have to put it in music. Maybe I'm going to get sectioned when I walk out of this door. Maybe, maybe the boys in blue are outside. I really hope not. <laughs> Don't worry, you can stand down. Stand down. <laughs> um, here's another uh, quandary, I think, with It's Not Living. Mm. Now, what kind of song is this? Because it is a love song. But it's also, you know, what is it a love song to or to whom or to what? What's that Smith song titled? The co girl, is it Girl in a Coma? What? Girl in a coma, yeah. I Girl know. in a coma. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's like, I, the way I always explain it, it's like, okay, it's a song that sounds poppy that's about something serious. Okay, right. That's straight up 1975. And that's because the feeling that I get from music, some narratively or musically, can kind of be the same thing. You know how, like, sometimes, like, being nervous or being, uh, being, like, anxious for a date physically could be the same feeling as like a fear of heights you know if you get rid of all the intellect like emotionally you get the same like physically you get the same thing so i've always been like i'd get this feeling when i read like the lyrics of hallelujah by leonard cohen but i get the same feel. sorry i keep it in the microphone way too gesticulative <laughs> and then so i get really excited i get this carnal feeling when i hear the lyrics to hallelujah leonard cohen but then i get the same feeling when i hear the music to girls just want to have fun so the synthesis of those ideas has always just been the most obvious thing in the world for me. Do you know what I mean? Like, m like pretty music breaks my heart anyway. Like, like I, very seldom am, am I moved to tears by something that's minor and like Nick, a performance by Nick Cave or a lyric by Nick Cave will go through me like a knife through butter. But very seldom does the music make me want to cry. Whereas I can listen to Loveless by My Bloody Valentine D not be able to even get any of the lyrics and cry my heart out. Do you know what I mean? Because it's so beautiful. My favourite music is music... I think my favourite music is music that's like in a major key that sticks to the, the what a pop song is but that comes f right from the left, 
field, you know? So all of that post-punk goes pop kind of stuff. Like, mm. that's, I always, I can't stop going on about Loveless by My Bloody Valentine, but it's because they're just pop songs that sound like they're drowning. It's like, that, that's the only thing that's happened. Like, you could, you could get rid of all of the distortion and they are these pristine pop ear candy things. The dis- distorting them, not in the way that you distort a guitar, I mean like emotionally, like, like in totally distorting things that are, that are normally regular and beautiful is something that really excites me. Um, but it's not living if it's not with you as well is... Yeah, I mean, I think that idea really sums up the 1975. And if you, you're you a big fan of the 1975, this is the 1975-iest song yes. on the new record, yeah. you know? This yeah. is the most like, oh yeah, I know who that is. Kind of thing, so. <laughs> but then you're also playing with it because of the, the words and, and what you're talking about. Yeah, and, yeah, I think you know. that it's... It, I find it quite funny as well because there's always been with... with I, I've... I've not like done some big reveal of my like relationship with with drugs over the past couple of years, but I have spoken about going to her, going to rehab to deal with those kind of things and all this kind of thing. And I think that because there was, I used to have nightmares about being exposed for being. Because remember, my whole game has always been the do do I know that you know that I think that I'm a rock star? That's always been my whole thing. Do you know what I mean? I've never been like hey, I'm Jim Morrison. My whole thing is that I know that I'm not and I know that you think that I think that I do, so I'm just going to play with this whole thing for ages, right? <laughs> so the idea, though, John, of, like, of, the, of, of the idea of actually being known for being like a junkie and doing those kind of things used to terrify me, like terrified me. Like, cause I was like Then I'm a cliche. I lose all my irony. I lose all of my funniness. I lose it because I'm an actual cliche. So I'd be terrified of it. I would always hide behind it. So I think even when I'm talking about it on this record, I'm still going, you know, Danny ran into some complicated... It's that like I'm using characters. It's a bit like somebody going like, I've got this mate, right? And uh, he's got this bit of this weird rash. And uh, it's a bit like, uh, right, well, tell your mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like we know who you're talking about. I think that the, the, the idea that I'm still trying to hide still trying to remove myself from it as part of the gag but then the chorus is brutally honest you know it's like it's difficult to write a song like that man not like aren't I clever for doing it I'm saying like it's hard to my to despise the idea of fetishizing or romanticizing drug use as a behavior but then only having my truth do you know what I mean? Like, I don't have anything else. I don't have anywhere else to talk about it. And there is a hopelessness to drug addiction, you know? You don't do it. You don't keep doing it because it's cool. You keep doing it because you feel like you, there's no life without it. And um, to express that, it wasn't like a relief for me. I'm not... The, the, the music is a catharsis for me. But I wasn't like I needed to get that out. Unfortunately, I'm only my set of experiences and they're pretty limited as somebody who's been on the road for four years and trying to mediate his life through drug addiction, you know. I didn't go out a lot. A lot of sleeping. <laughs> so, so, so do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. Um, so yeah, so it was, it's difficult to w- walk that line. Um, but I just had to make sure that like with most of my work any discussion of my behavior is normally with a profound distaste you know Mm. and kids are smart man you know you know like people are smart you know like there's so many young young women that are into our band so many and i'd learned so much from them that's the whole thing i was you know mary shelley wrote frankenstein when she was 17 so like i'm not i'm not patronizing anyone (laughs) like you know I, i i refuse to you know, people are too smart, and there is c- quite a tight door policy on our band because you, you know, it's difficult. It can be difficult to get into us, especially like on our last two records. If you were someone like my age, because mm. you have to like me, and that's that takes time. You know, I'm annoying at f- starts for starts because there's, <laughs> there's so much. Yeah. So you have to let that happen, and then you have to go. Actually, no, this isn't. I get this, you know. But we'll we'll get there.
Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I think that's going to really happen with this new record. Oh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be amazing to see just how it connects with people. Thank you. Um, Surrounded by Heads and Bodies is the next song. And again, I mean, you mentioned Danny and It's Not Living. There's another character uh, mentioned in this, Angela, mm. who I think is a real person, though. Yeah, I, yeah. The, the, she is a real person. That it's not necessarily that a lot of the things like you know, what do you do? Change the names and stuff like that. Mm. There was just this one person. Most rehab is very group based. Uh, it's very twelve step based. I would have really struggled with that. Um, I was in this new facility, kind of an experimental facility. I was by myself. I had my nurses and I had my doctors, but I was by myself. There was another building across the way that housed this woman, you know, that I refer to as Angela in the song. And um it was I used to get really defensive about the word the use of the word depression. Oh, I'm really depressed. Uh, just because my I think it's because my mum has suffered from clinical depression for so long. And when it's like a parent, um and, it hap- and it's something that goes throughout your youth. It's hard, you know. It's re- I wrote a song about it called She Lays Down, you know. Like, you don't have a choice with depression, you know. And then um, it's so debilitating and it, and it has such a... It manifests itself so physically and I'm so... I know it as soon as I see it. And I think the line, there's a line in the song that's like Angela... Um, she wears it like a dress, you know. The... Um, I think that I couldn't it I, I just I was so moved by her and I was so stripped of who I was and everything. It was the first person to person. No culture, no where you're from, no money, no clothes. We had clothes on, but no like this is who I am through wearing clothes. D- d- no social no posturing. Two people who were broken in a field with horses. And it was... It was just an incredible purity to it. We were from the same road. Not the same town. Like, eventually I was like, where are you, where are you from? She was posh as well. She talked quite spoke like this. She was more like that. I said, like, where are you from? She was like, I'm from Manchester. I said, oh, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm from Manchester. I was like, I'm not actually from Manchester. Though. I say that I'm from like South Manchester. She was like, oh yeah, me too, actually. I'm from, I was like, well, I said, I'm like kind of Wilmslow. She was like, I'm from Wilmslow. I was like, oh, that's mental. I'm not actually from Wilmslow. I'm, I'm from like Oddly Edge, which is just next to Wilmslow or whatever. Um, from the same road. <laughs> that is amazing. So two people on the other side of the world. In Barbados. Happened to end up in the same place. At the same time from the same place from walking distance yeah. from each other's wow. houses we got we really emotional when we found that out um it's um i think that i just um had been on the road for so long and it'd been so loud for so long and it was the first time that it was quiet and um i really drank it in and, and it was good for me and this song kind of materialised and I like this song because it's not striving to be anything it's just a moment it was just a moment and, and yeah mm. I mean it sounds sounds so beautiful I think it's so gentle sweet thank you uh, but has a sadness to it as mm. well continues that whole jazz feel that we've been talking about a bit mm. already um, some beautiful piano it could be a, a bit of Michael Jackson or Prince or Whitney Houston you know, all sorts of of people you know conjured up by this song for sure but very 1975 at the exactly. same time I think the tempo makes people go oh jazz you know mm. it reminds me more of like you know Michael Jackson had that obsession with like Charlie Chaplin he did a cover of Smile and stuff like that it's um I just I just love songs. I love great songs. It doesn't matter where they're from. And sometimes they just have to have a context, have a pace. Maybe they need an elegance. Maybe they need something. But I am... I love that song because... I wrote it. And then recorded a bit of it. 
put it down and then listen to it like six months later and I, I was like this sounds a bit like a cover and that's such an exciting thing as a songwriter I was like I feel like I know this more than I know it just because it's mine mm. felt really classic um, and it was the moment where me and George kind of really realised that we were really on the same page you know it was uh, because that song sounds so like one person that wrote it start to finish but the piano bit at the beginning da, 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 all of that stuff that whole intro and the bit where I come in and go there comes a time and a young George wrote that bit I wrote the other bit completely independent of each other in the same tempo in the same key and I turned up like oh, I've got this thing to show you he was like I've got this thing to show you and it and it was two halves of of one song and I mean I'm 29 and we've been doing this since we were 13 so you'd hope that it'd start to feel natural <laughs> eventually that is yeah what's I mean that is fantastic but what is also great is that you pull from so much you know you reference so many different things so mm. you know this could be Gershwin it could be it's you know, Gershwin it's Oscar Peterson yeah. it's, it's like like blue train kind of Coltrane mm. like um it's this analogy that I keep saying, the magpie analogy, man. A magpie will collect anything shiny, you know? A piece of foil, a diamond, a piece of glass, you know? It doesn't matter. My shiny is pretty. So it's beautiful, like a beautiful bit of melody. If It doesn't matter if it's, you know, if it comes from a song from Squeeze or, you know, like I don't, you know, or Barbra Streisand. It means, it means nothing to me where I got it from. It's music. I love music. Um, and music's bigger than taste and style. And Music's like a thing that happens. You know? This intangible thing. And um, I'm not going to start putting rules on it. You know? Because that's the thing, isn't it? Like, if we could wake up one day and the idea of genre was gone and you went to your record collection and listened to it, it would be like a psychedelic experience. Like, the perspective would... It's like, it would be incredible. And I think, generationally, we're getting closer and closer to that kind of place. Yeah. And, and I think mine is, is reflective of two things. Not wanting to be bored. The main reason for all of this. <laughs> and having the same la la lack of filter that stops anybody on their iPod going from Carol King to ASAP Rocky. No, society, culture, apps, technology, nobody is telling you not to do that. Nothing is telling you not to do that. And nothing is telling me not to apply the same rule to, you know, we create in the way we consume, you know. So... It's just how it happens. Yeah. <coughs> but you continue the feel from mine with I Couldn't Be More In Love, mm -hmm. um, which connects together really well. No, so yeah, that, yeah. that's not making that massive no, 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 juxtaposition that, 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 that you do elsewhere on the record, but yeah. um, no, it, it continues it really nicely. And um, it's it's a really heartfelt, passionate song, yeah. it seems. And, and you know, it, again, I hear a lot of Michael Jackson in this. Oh, I and mean, it's... Bit yeah. of Prince and there's a, a guitar solo in there. You know, Jackson liked a good old guitar solo. Oh yeah, he did. <laughs> Thank you, Michael Jackson and Prince in the same sentence. That's well, incredible. It's, it's, Thank you so much. It's just a fact. And and the choir come back. The choir come back. Um, th that's um, that's my best song because I tried to do that. Like, I'd set out to do that. And, um... The vocal is interesting. Vocals, we actually ended up... I sang it better than that. But the vocals were kind of like pre-rehab, and it's not the whole, oh, rehab was a thing. Rehab was a thing. It was a thing, and I did it, and I'm glad that I did that I did it. And, it, you know... But the whole pre-rehab, post-rehab thing isn't... It's not really that much like that. But before I'd been I was tired I was exhausted you know I needed to go somewhere to have a break we ended up using the vocals that I recorded at that time because they were a bit more guttural they were a bit more 
they just had this they had a reality to them reality to them and um that song is very 1975 in the way that it sounds like a love song i think i throw a she in there as well i i say at one point she said i gave you the rest of my life so you immediately go okay mm. i know the perspective because i kind of wanted to do that but the song is about what happens after th this what happens when no one cares like i'll be i'll deal with it but like i'm not lying when i say like this is my negotiation with reality this is how i make sense of everything like i would struggle as a human being so much more if i didn't have this vehicle and it's not being like loved or being known but it's i suppose knowing that i have this vehicle you know and the fear that most artists don't talk about about how you will have to adjust when it inevitably changes so you know what about these feelings i've got like we got it wrong you said you'd had enough but what about these feelings I've got? You know, I couldn't be more in love. And then in the bridge, it's like, I'm desperate. You know, I could have been a great line <laughs> or I could have been a sign at least, you know. I, 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 and it's a, it's just about me saying like, like, thank you for the, like, for the, um, in, for the apparatus that I'm given to, to do this because it's, it's my purpose. You know, it is my purpose. So yeah, amazing. And that's you playing the guitar solo. It is me playing the guitar so solo. You, you let it all out and through the guitar as well. Which I really is amazing. did. I really did. I love that. I love that performance. Um, and in some ways, it's interesting because we've talked about a lot of things. We've talked about the music, and we've talked about a lot of the ideas that are going on in the songs. We haven't talked about the title of the album mm. much. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you have referred to the internet and uh, the negotiation mm. of of life in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, but why did you go with this title? I think it summed it up because I had the the profound and not ref pr profound the interesting and not interesting realization that i keep saying this all the time so apologies if anybody's heard me say this before but let's say outside outside of what we're doing right now face to face communication all of our communication is mediated through the internet that's not really interesting thing for us to ponder upon we know that if we told somebody that 10 years ago that all communication outside of face-to-face -face communication will happen in some regard through the internet it would be a point of interest at least it would we would kind of maybe ask okay like, like how like how are we going to do that and like and why and 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 for for what reason and the, why does why does the experience of why does it need to be so total in the human experience but we didn't and we are where we are now and i realized that now I'm making a record about life, therefore I'm making about a record about my relationships and how they're mediated. And if you're making a record about relationships now, you're kind of making a record about the internet by proxy, you know? And it's an interesting time because it poses questions for writers. It makes you cringe sometimes if, you know, Katy Perry uses epic fail in a song. Do you know what I mean? I, the example I use is that Neil Young isn't going to reference FaceTime in his new album because we don't allow such mo we don't allow them into the lexicon of artistic ideas my sweet love so far away do you want to FaceTime do you know what I mean like it doesn't it, <laughs> it doesn't work but it but it's deconstructed romantic themes themes of loneliness themes it's deconstructed everything and an online relationship you know you say that word, you think of Tinder, you think of Match.com, but online relationships are... Most people's main relationship with all with their friends is in a group chat, or the, the broader people that they know is through their Instagram story. These are all online relationships. So I was making a record about the internet, whether I liked it or not, you know? Mm. Um, so, yeah. Interesting. I Always Want to Die Sometimes is the closing song <laughs> on the album. Um, you bring out the acoustic guitar again. Um, yeah. There's that piano there as well. Uh, the drums come in. But the vocal is is really clear, yeah. I think. It's, it's, it's like a very honest vocal on this it's song. It's a very honest song, isn't it? There's not mm. a lot of trappings. There's no production tricks. There's, it's a song. Um, it's a song that uplifts you it's an uplifting song i don't want to take away from anything like that i wanted it to be quite american 
you know I think that whether you have a song like that on the acoustic guitar it's very tempting to go down the route of the birth or this very kind of dark Brit British kind of sound but I love you know like I said you know like Goo Goo Dolls Iris or you know that that big anthemic American feel you know, I don't want to miss a thing is probably a good example do you know well, what I the mean Aerosmith, the Aerosmith yeah, one yeah. I'm talking in production terms there's a lot more right Go, going on so this is the 1975 do a power ballad it's not the 1975 do a power ballad but it, I'm morely talking the option of I had the option to go dark and gritty or, or bright and celebratory and I think the stylistic choice of bright and celebratory even exaggerated the lyrics and the tone and the darkness that's there and um, yeah and as a song it, it, it and it comes at the end of the record and I suppose it's kind of like saying you know, oh well, <laughs> what, what are we going to do? You know, like, it's, it's so serious and there's so much discussed and it talks about, you know, how these, not just pop culture, but literature, culture in general, it, 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 it promises us these destinations in our life. Happiness, you'll get to happiness. Being a grown-up, like like it'll be a destination that you arrive at and none of us ever are and we're always asking why and it's because you never do, you know? It's just you. That's why holidays can be rubbish, because you go, you go, I'm going to go on holiday and get away from everything. And then you go on holiday and you're there. You know, you are everything. So I think that you'll never get away from yourself. And you've got nihilism on the right hand side. You've got religion on the left. No, let's swap them over. You've got religion on the right, nihilism on the left, and just trying in the middle. And I think this one's just about the middle, you know? And saying to us all that we just should try and just get on with it. Not not well, not necessarily just get on with it, but I honestly, I don't know what the other option is. Let's just listen to some music, you know, give each other a snog, go to bed early. <laughs> <laughs> this is sound advice from Matty Healy. <laughs> and and you've got David Cavill then who did the strings for the David Iris Cameron. by Go Go Goo Goo Dolls. Goo Goo Dolls, yeah, mm. Beck's dad. Oh, right, of course, yeah. yeah. So, um, Fantastic. And then there's a kind of string outro at the end of the song as well, a kind of like a... a I wanted the album to be like the ending of The Graduate, you know? Yeah. I wanted it to be like, I mean, a song in E that f goes all the way that I Always Want to Die does and then finishes on an acoustic guitar, on an E chord, glory, yes, we made it, and then I like going did we <laughs> you know because that's the end of the graduate you know the excitement that was amazing we did it we completed the thing we did we made the romantic gesture and then they're sat on the bus and the camera stays with them and you see reality creeping back in after they've had that escape and that's what I wanted the end of the record to be fantastic and that's how we can look forward to the next one because there's there's this future and you're already working on the next one you've got the next one nearly done is no that right? not or nearly done i'm no. just trying i'm just working on it but i'm letting it happen naturally i mean to be honest with you like i talk a lot and i say all oh, next album in april and it's going to sound like this i don't know what i'm on about but i know that it'll be out before august of next year right and there's a title already notes on a conditional yeah. form yeah yeah so that's that's going to be the title. oh that's staying yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so uh, yeah it, it would be too much paperwork if i wanted to change that <laughs> <laughs> fantastic well let's hope we see you before the end of august then to do this again oh i'd love to do this for notes yeah. it would be wicked yeah fantastic matty thank you so much thank you for having me thank you radio x